Hello, everybody. This is Roger Durling, Executive Director at the Santa Barbara International Film Festival, and I am deeply honored to have our two guests today to discuss their documentary, incredible documentary, Kingdom of Silence. We have with us um, Director Rick Rowley and also uh, executive producer, and I like to say this, Pulitzer Prize winning journalist, um, Larry Wright. Welcome, uh, gentlemen. Um, very glad to have you here. Um, I actually gonna start right away with both of you. Um, this documentary, it is so fascinating. I, Jamal, was such an active participant in all this event since 1986. And the, the way you guys document this whole period, I, I don't recall a documentary where I see a character changing throughout, throughout, you know, this, all the different events that he's involved with. Um, you know, can you tell us about, about that arc in Jamal's story. Yeah, thanks. I mean, that really, you know, cuts to the heart of it all for us. I mean, when I started working on this film, I thought it was gonna be, uh, you know, an investigative thriller about the moment of his murder, about like the last, you know, month or days of his life. Um, and very quickly, as we begun investigating, you know, I mean, we, we did what you normally do. We met with intelligence officials. We got, you know, documents, things leaked to us. We you know, learned new details about his murder, but very quickly it became clear that a far more fascinating story than, um, uh, than the details of this event that we all have come to know so well uh, was that, you know, who was this man that the kingdom of Saudi Arabia, the prince would risk so much to murder. And uh, the more we dug into that story, I mean, that story, the, uh, you know, normally when you decide to sink into a character, the story gets smaller and more narrow and, and you know, and, and tighter. Jamal, the, the deeper we got into his character, the wider and broader and more sprawling his story became because he's a man who lived his life at the center of a whirlwind. Like, you know, 1986, the first journalist to take a photograph of Osama bin Laden. He uh, helps yeah. propagate the kind of the myth and the story of bin Laden, right? Publishes, um, you know, uh, communiques from the, from the front lines of the, of the jihad war, the, the jihad against the Soviets in Afghanistan. Um, then he sees, um, this man who he helped turn into a hero turned to a villain before his eyes in September 11th. And he's um, deeply wounded by that. Um, and he allows himself to be changed by the things that he's seen and participated in. Um, and that, that continues throughout his life. After bin Laden, he's sort of forced into the arms of the princes who, who uh, run Saudi Arabia and the Gulf. And then uh, when, with the death of the Arab Spring, he sees them again turn into villains in this massive kind of global crime and he's changed, you know, he's, uh, he's transformed by it again, um, which, you know, leads him up to a moment um, uh, where, you know, his martyrdom then is kind of also a moment of redemption where he, he, he recognizes the tortured compromises he's been forced to make and the way that he has himself become implicated in all of these kind of systems of violence. And he, he refuses to be a part of it and choose it or, and he refuses to be silent. And he takes a stand and for that, He's murdered by the people who he spent his life serving. Um, Larry, one of I before um, you came uh, um, on, I was talking to to uh, Rick about all. I had to see the film so many times, your film, because there were so many bits of information that actually made me gasp. I was so um, sh just shocked. For example, <laughs> um, the the. Uh, the, his longtime friend that he met in 1986, Abdullah, um, and, and his relationship throughout the years and how it changed. You know, can you talk about finding that, that fact? Are you talking about Abdullah Anas? I, I'm Correct, guessing. yes, uh, yes. He's, he's such a great figure. Uh, and Rick got to spend some time with him in the film. Uh, I, you know, when you think about the people that fought the jihad against the Soviets, and just imagine, you know, people coming out of North Africa and the Middle East, uh, you know, they're facing what was one of the great superpowers. You know, there were just two, you know, the Soviet Union and the United States, and they had the temerity to think that they could actually uh, make a difference. And so 
Abdullah Anas is one of those warriors uh, who took up this cause. And, you know, there's a difference between what happened with bin Laden and what happened with uh, Abdullah Anas. When the Soviet Union withdrew from Afghanistan, there was a fork in the road. You know, mm. they had, you know, the, the, there was no longer a need for the jihad in Afghanistan. It was over. Uh, the re reconstituting the government was what was called for. But for some that followed Osama bin Laden, they decided to take that group of people who have remained in the jihad and form them into a different kind of thing, which became Al Qaeda. Abdullah Anas was not a part of that. He stood apart from that. And, and so did Jamal. Uh, so, you know, the, that was a great divide in, uh, you know, there was once a moment of unity where so many Muslims decided we have to chase the Soviet Union out of a Muslim country and they succeeded. And they were all together on that. But after that, uh, the next chapter uh, divided that group and, you know, with profound consequences. Yeah. Um, uh, Rick, um, you know, following up on that, the, the fact that we get to see the story of, of the, the Middle East through the eyes of Jamal in relationship to the United States as well and our involvement, was that something that going into this, you understood that it, it was going to be part of the main theme, one of the main themes of, the, of your documentary, or was that a discovery? No, it was uh, absolutely going in from the very beginning. We knew that this was a story about uh, the toxic relationship between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia, and this man who lived his life at the at the margin of it, right at the center of it, from you know from '86 uh, to the present. Um, you know, at, at the moment, at all the key moments when that relationship changed and evolved, and it was one of the things that that drew me to this story in the first place. I mean. I've been a war reporter for a decade in Iraq, Afghanistan, Yemen, Somalia, the other kind of front lines of the global war on terror. And in every one of these local conflicts, Saudi Arabia is an active participant. That's not a, a controversial statement. I mean, every combatant commander on any side of a conflict recognizes that immediately, but it's something that's never talked about, the, um, or rarely talked about in the, uh, in, in the global press. And so telling the story of, of this incredibly violent, toxic, chaotic role that Saudi Arabia has played in the region is something I've, I've wanted to do for a very long time. And Jamal's story cuts to the heart of that. But then, you know, more importantly than that in the end, I mean, Jamal was, um, Jamal was murdered for his speech, right? He, was, he right. was murdered by the people he criticized. And as a journalist, you know, he was one of our own. And when one of our own is killed like that, it falls on us to rescue what we can of their story mm -hmm. from the silence that these dictators would impose. You know, um, Roger, I was no, gonna go say, add on to what Rick was saying. You know, we think of Jamal's life as being in three acts, which is kind of the story of the Middle East, uh, you know, the, the jihad against the Soviets, 9-11 and the Arab Spring. And, and in each of those, uh, Jamal played a central figure. But I think that we're, what we're seeing now is the opening of a fourth act. And it's his death that inaugurates that. That is the relationship of Jamal and Mohammed bin Salman. And so the, the new era that we're entering is something that, you know, Jamal unfortunately didn't live to see, but his death in many ways has created it. Mm -hmm. There is there is so much to talk about, and and you guys, um, I want to have follow up questions. But but you brought up the the notion of journalism, and one of the remarkable things about watching your peas and journalism, the fact that he was practicing journalism where where few held power, um, and 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 navigated a very a tightrope. You know, can you can you elaborate on that difficult? Um, plays. I mean, he was skating on thin ice. Rick, do you mind if I respond to that? I, yeah, was, yeah. I, you know, when after 9-11, the Saudis wouldn't let me in as a reporter. Uh, and so I had to take a job and I became the mentor to these young reporters in, in Jeddah, which is bin Laden's hometown. And I was working for this Arab uh, newspaper and, and Jamal worked at a 
competitive newspaper, which was a lot better newspaper than the one that I worked for. But uh, I and I got to know him then and really, really like him. And what was so distinguished, distinguished, distinguishing about him is he was not afraid. You know, there was this atmosphere of, of fear in Saudi Arabia. And my, I was teaching these young reporters skills they really couldn't use in many respects. They, you know, the, you couldn't write about the royal family. You couldn't write about religion. You couldn't write about government. It doesn't leave very much on your plate, you know, when you're a reporter. But Jamal, uh, he, he was the one who would lay out for you. Here are the rules, you know, here, you know, and he was, he was funny, he was cynical, uh, but he was very sophisticated and helpful. Uh, and I learned a lot about Saudi Arabia and through the constraints that they put on journalists. And it was those constraints that Jamal was always trying to break. And, you know, he, they made him for a while the editor of Al Watan, a very important newspaper in the South where many of the hijackers came from. And he lasted only a couple of months that first go around. One thing that he did was publish a cartoon of an imam uh, wearing a, a, a bomber vest. And instead of dynamite, there were fatwas in the vest and instantly he was gone. But he was always pushing the boundaries of what was possible for journalists in, in the Middle East, not just in Saudi Arabia. Um, Rick, you, you mentioned that when you first started the documentary it was this sort of murder mystery about what about the murder of him um how how you pivot it to you know now the story becomes about this this um you know battle of aut autocracy and tyranny and democracy um how how difficult for you was to pivot i mean it was uh it was it was so natural that it felt inevitable when it finally happened. I mean, because, you know, we, uh, for two reasons. I mean, first, we, um, we discovered some new things about the murder, but, but really the, the most important and most interesting questions weren't in that, weren't housed there, right? I mean, you know, did um, MBS order the murder? Yes, he ordered the murder. We all know that. That's known, mm -hmm. you know, all over the world. So that's not a question was I mean how was the murder undertaken we know in excruciating graphic detail every every moment of that uh, of that horrific kind of process those things are not those aren't mysteries to unravel but what became much more I mean the important question the question that is left with you is why it, in the cat like the the largest city of our NATO ally Turkey uh, another one of our most important regional allies um, undertook this horrific murder of a U.S. resident who was working for one of the most important newspapers in the in the United States. Like that is a an act of insane recklessness. It's incredibly risky. Why would who was this man that the kingdom would risk uh, would risk so much to to silence and murder? That's the that's the question you want answered. And so we you know, um, and it's a question that is much that sent us on a journey that was much longer than just a trip to Istanbul. I mean, it sent us to Afghanistan and then we had to sneak into uh, Saudi Arabia itself. Um, we were denied journalist visas, but we went in anyway. And then, um, uh, and um, yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the soul of the, of the story, really. Um, I read somewhere, uh, just follow up to what you're saying about sneaking in, et cetera, that you use small mirrorless cameras to get footage. You know, can you tell us, you know, more about about yeah. your your tactics to get the footage? No, totally. Yeah. So we, uh, you know, we were we spent months and months talking to the Saudi embassy uh, and, uh, you know, to try to go through the front door and get journalist visas. They're claim to be open to the press now, but, uh, but we were, you know, denied. So um, I got a, I managed to get a tourist visa and I just flew in on that. And I brought small cameras that look just like tourist cameras, but nowadays, you know, the 4k and, you know, they're, they're wonderful. Um, uh, and I stayed, uh, so there's this moment in the rise of Mohammed bin Salman, where he undertakes his coup, basically, where he rounds up uh, a couple hundred of the most prominent uh, people in the country and imprisons them in the in Ritz-Carlton Hotel. And they're tortured inside the hotel and 
One of them dies, a general whose body is covered with electrical burns and his neck is broken. So a horrific things happened, um, you know, in, in plain sight inside of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. So we, uh, no one wanted to stay there now. So I actually had to, I stayed inside the Ritz-Carlton and at night would prowl the halls, like filming the footage for it. It was, um, it was a, an incredibly surreal experience to be, you know, knowing that you're staying in the bed of someone who was, uh, who horrific things happened to while you were filming. But yeah, we traveled around the country and filmed and I, um, you know, worked with a great anonymous local crew um, and, uh, um, uh, and we kept it as low profile as we could. Um, did you, were you in danger at any moment or? I mean, we've, uh, we got threats. I mean, uh, you know, if you, you can't, of course we got threats. Like it's, you, you, um, you can't begin a project like this and imagine that you won't be threatened in some way. Uh, but I mean, whatever risks we took uh, were nothing in comparison with the people who worked with us on the ground, not just in Saudi, but in Afghanistan and elsewhere. Um, I mean, I am I am always humbled by by that because they, you know, the they understand the people who spoke to us who are Saudis and the people who lived in Saudi and worked with us and helped us, they understand the risks far more than we do, far better than we do. Um, and yet they they decided to run these risks because they believe so deeply in the power of the story. Like they believe that if Americans knew this history, that it would matter somehow, that it would maybe change things. And so, um, I mean, it always, it always humbles me and fills me with an immense kind of sense of, you know, responsibility, like after that, uh, to make it, make it matter somehow. Um, Larry, another of the surprising, um, things that are brought up in the film is the 9-11 the and, and the families wanting to speak to, um, in, to um, uh, Jamal. And, I, and there was supposed to be a second interview as well. You know, can you tell us about that aspect of the story? Well, there are things about 9-11 we still don't know, Roger. And, uh, you know, one was, you know, two hijackers came to America in January of of, of, of 2000, 19 months before 9-11. And the CIA found out about it uh, in March of that year. Uh, so uh, what was going on? CIA knew they were here. They didn't tell the FBI. And the families of the victims uh, have been asking questions like that uh, ever since the 9-11 commission report. There were 28 pages that were suppressed and they managed through legal action to finally get them released. There's more information and that, you know, for instance, you know, what was the CIA planning to do uh, with those hijackers? What, how did they get away from it? So, and what was the relationship of the Saudi royal family and the government to Al Qaeda and those hijackers in the US? Those are questions that linger here's 20 years, you know, that we haven't had answers to those questions. And the, the main people who are pushing for it are the families and when Jamal, agreed to talk to them. Uh, I think that was an, a trigger uh, for the Saudi authorities. Um, why do you think, I mean, as I said, I've watched this so many, I mean, a couple of times your film, why, why did Jamal made the fatal error of going to the consulate? Um, did, did, couldn't he have sensed that there was gonna be a trap in there for him? Oh, uh, well, Istanbul is, you know, Turkey is a, is a, is a very strong country. Uh, I, I don't think that he would have imagined that the Saudis would be so absurd as to try to kill him in a foreign country, a, you know, a neighboring Muslim country. Uh, it, it really beggars the imagination. You know, he went initially to the embassy in Washington and uh, uh, Mohammed bin Salman's kid brother was the ambassador. And uh, he told him, you're gonna have to go get this in Istanbul. Uh, that didn't make any sense. Maybe you're right. Maybe there should have been a flag that went up. But I think, you know, operating in Washington and Istanbul, I don't think that Jamal thought that he was in danger. Maybe Rick has a different view of it, but it seemed to me that if he was asked to go back to the kingdom, that would be an entirely different matter. 
Yeah, no, I, th I think you're exactly right. I mean, if he was in Morocco or another country, Egypt, uh, that might have been uh, a place where he would keep his distance from uh, an embassy because anything could happen there. But, but Turkey, as you say, the, our largest, the largest military in, our, in NATO outside the United States, uh, a, a very powerful country with, a, as, as was made clear, a very sophisticated security apparatus that yeah. runs circles around Saudis. Uh, I mean, it was, uh, um, it, it was not a, uh, it, yeah, he thought he was safe because he was in Turkey. Um, I, I, I want to talk a little bit about the film itself because it's so well put together. Um, you know, can you tell us about the process of editing all of the footage that you've put together and, and, and the narrative, how it is so laser focused and is so well written. Um, you know, can you tell us about your process, um, Rick? Yeah, well, I mean, Larry did a great job of laying out for you, you know, the acts that structure, you know, that we see structuring Jamal's life and they, um, and they fall so, so cleanly. I mean, um, the jihad in Afghanistan is, you know, act one where he's, um, uh, where he's young and he's rising and he's a true believer uh, and he becomes famous and, uh, and his career takes off. September 11th, which, you know, is a world historical event that changes Saudi's relationship with the world again, uh, in which he's also a, like a friend of bin Laden's who sees everything fall apart and then becomes a spokesman for, um, uh, for the, Saudi government, basically, mm -hmm. as it tries to keep that relationship together. Again, he's at the center of that kind of period of time. And then with the Arab Spring, he finds himself torn between the princes he serves and the movement that he loves. Um, and that, you know, so so his life really, really did arc um, very closely to these big historical moments in our in our relationship with uh, with the Middle East. So that uh, that was incredibly useful, right? And provided a you know a a clean line you can cut through 30 years of chaos, um, right? So, you know, we, I mean, that's, and that's what you always have to do in a documentary. I mean, every, every life, even a life not as sweeping and as global as Jamal's is, um, is, is complex and full of, of details. His, uh, you know, story fell so cleanly like that. And then, and then it, the, the delicate balancing act for us was to, um, was to string together this huge global story, which was which was central to understanding both the man and understanding ourselves and our role and everything. To balance that with uh, with the kind of more intimate story of Jamal as he moved through. So what we did was we went through and we gathered all of the all of the um, the written work of Jamal's we could find from his whole career, not just published articles in Arabic and in English, but you know personal correspondence. Um, you know, text messages and WhatsApp messages going back for, for years. A lot of people who were afraid to speak to us on camera were willing to share with us correspondence from him at, at different periods in his life. And so there are, um, there are sort of chapter headings and act turns that are narrated by, uh, by Jamal himself, right? There are, you know, uh, excerpts from his writing at different times that locate him at these uh, at these key moments when everything sorts of sort of shifts, and so you can hear and feel him kind of growing and changing, and his voice changing as he as he moves on. I mean, he Progresses, begins, yes. yeah, and he begins sounding like a young reporter who's writing in a more careful kind of way. And by the time he gets to the end, he's speaking from the heart um, uh, as someone who senses that he's on the precipice of something kind of dark. Mm -hmm. Um, why did you, was it, she was not willing to speak to you, her, his, his fiance? Um, yeah, well, I mean, we, uh, we interviewed the people who were, who, who were closest to him for the longest part of his life. Okay. Um, right. Um, I mean, those were, those were the, the people who we kind of focused on. So, you know, friends who'd known him for, you know, for 30 years, um, uh, Khadija, his fiance that he was getting the papers to uh, okay. to marry in, in Istanbul, is a has been a wonderful vocal, you know, spokesperson for the struggle to preserve his memory and to fight for justice for him afterwards, and is clearly an important relationship. And so, you know, we include her kind of speaking before Congress. Um, I mean, they met uh, three months before he he died, and they were together only a few days, tragically, like only a few days, uh, you know, together in the same city. 
in in his whole life. Um, and so she was, you know, they grew close quickly. But that there were his relationship with the women in his life was was quite complicated. Um, you know, his true like the person who everyone calls his true love was was the wife that he had to abandon and leave in Saudi Arabia. And then he married again in in um, uh, in Washington to uh, an Egyptian woman. Um, and then in the kind of loneliness and despair of his exile, he uh, he began this relationship with Hadija. So he had a he had a very complicated romantic life that um, that was, you know, uh, that we didn't want to smooth out and you know because he, Jamal's turned into sort of a caricature in the American press, right? Like he's he's pre like presented as the uh, this eternal dissident who was just he was always always the same role, always the same note, always just fighting against the system, and then suddenly pushed too far, and then he was killed. Whereas he was much more complicated and evolved and was contradictory and and was on the wrong side of history at different moments, but then changed and adapt evolved, and so we wanted to kind of capture capture all of that. Um, uh, Larry, at the at the end of the documentary, we we get a sense that um, Jamal there there's a sense of sadness and bitterness and betrayal about uh, all these heroes that he championed and somehow turned into villains. You know, can you elaborate on that? On that, you know, when you say that, Roger, what comes to mind? I had a conversation with this uh, Jordanian. Uh, woman uh, some while ago and she said how long will the Middle East be a cemetery for youth and hope and wow. you know the answer is we don't know how long it's going to happen uh, it hasn't changed it really hasn't changed enough to accommodate the dreams of all the young people uh, that want to live a full life and that was part of Jamal's mission he wanted freedom uh, freedom of expression was his main goal. Uh, he wasn't trying to bring down the royal family, but, you know, more space for freedom. And uh, the forces of uh, repression inside many of these tyrannical governments are so powerful that you, you risk your life. Obviously, he lost his life. But, uh, you know, that's the story still in the Middle East. And unfortunately, it's an emblematic story. It's not a unique one. Mm -hmm. And do you think that there will ever be a sense of, um, I mean, justice about Jamal's uh, murder? No, I don't think so. I, I think, you know, he, he, we know who did it. We know why they did it. And we know how they did it. Everything that you would need to prove and get a conviction in court uh, is already widely known. But uh, will anything happen because of it? I don't think so. It's certainly nothing has happened to this date. And I think the, you know, the, the perpetrators are just waiting for this to be forgotten. And our mission is to keep that from happening. Correct. And that, that's, the, I mean, that was my follow-up question. Is, is this why you feel this documentary is so important to keep this alive? I hate to say that our, our documentary stands in the place of justice. You know, we wouldn't need to do this documentary if there was justice. But until there is justice, I hope that this documentary will be available for people to know the real story. Mm -hmm. um, on, a, on a technical uh, level, um, uh, Rick, the, the sequence that, that towards the end where we find out about the murder and we hear the transcripts, et cetera, it's, it's chilling. And you know, can you tell us about putting that that chapter together and the, the cinematic choices that you made that have quite an impact of us hearing things? Uh, uh, yeah, go ahead. I'm putting words in your mouth. Yeah, no, it's um, uh, it is a it's a very delicate thing whenever you're going to show the moment that a, a human being is dying. Um, or, or being murdered. I mean, even even worse. And so, so it's we we weave three elements through that kind of sequence. Uh, first, there's the transcript itself, which we uh, which we show you know visually on the screen, like you see the words as they were transcribed, um, you know, by the UN from the Turkish uh, recordings. Then we have uh, we have the voice of the UN rapporteur who gives you know who who 
gives you the important kind of narrative moments on it. But then it was important for us to have a human voice. He's one of his closest friends uh, who, who talks through each one of these moments to let you, you know, remind you that this was a human being um, and that this, to, because there's a danger that you, that you sensationalize these moments and that you turn them into moments of carnage that you're desensitized from. But, um, but each, each moment through, we kind of bring that voice in and, and work the rhythm across there. I mean, another thing that was particularly chilling to us that we discovered over the course of this is uh, the person who greets him as he walks into the consulate is, um, was an old friend of his. Um, was someone who he knew from the embassy in, uh, in London. And so when he walks in the front door, the first person he greets is this old friend and he, he's surprised and he like greets him warmly. Um, uh, and that, that just, that's a, such a sadistic kind of twist that they put on, you know, that MBS put on this whole thing to send his friend to kill him. Such like a, um, you know, like, like a mafia um, killing. I mean, it was, uh, it was, it's really, I mean, it's, it's, really unspeakable and and without kind of parallel in uh in at least my experience covering this kind of stuff mm -hmm. Roger, um, one, yeah, i want to add one thing these events are still happening uh the saudis are still threatening uh, you know people that are uh you know as citizens in exile uh you know uh, un rapporteurs and people like that sending similar messages to the ones that uh that jamal received before he was murdered so it's not a it's not unfortunately not just history uh we're talking about this is ongoing mm -hmm. absolutely um i i wanted to ask about has has the are you larry aware of the the MBS having seen the documentary or 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 heard about the documentary and any feedback you've gotten? I have a thing about it. Maybe Rick has heard something, but uh, no, uh, I think that uh, they're probably being as quiet as possible about it. Rick, have you heard anything? Yeah, no, we know uh, we know that some people have seen it back in Saudi Arabia on VPNs, and we've heard we've gotten uh, we've gotten kind feedback from folks in the region, a, a bunch of people in the region uh, who are who are so happy that a film like this could be made. But yeah, I mean, Larry's right. Like their the their policy is going to be to pretend it doesn't exist, um, ignore it, you know, as long as they can. Mm -hmm. But I'm, and, I'm sure they like they definitely know about it. I mean, they they monitor this kind of thing all the time, so they're they're totally aware of it. And they people in the royal court have I'm sure seen it, um, uh, but they're going to pretend that it doesn't exist. Yeah. And I mean, we we know the role. I mean, you document the role of uh, the previous uh, administration, U.S. administration, vis-a-vis uh, -vis the Saudis. Is there change um, happening now, Larry, with, with the Biden administration? Well, this, the Biden administration has put Saudi Arabia on notice that the relationship is not going to be the same as it was with Trump. And remember that the very first foreign trip that Donald Trump made as president was to Saudi Arabia. You know, how weird and what a signal that was. Uh, so, but beyond the declaration, you know, that things were not gonna be the same, I haven't seen much change. So, and it may be that there are things going on behind the curtains, I don't know. But, you know, the, the Saudis are not happy that Biden's in office, but so far as I know, concrete actions haven't been taken. Mm -hmm. And um, and and I apologize that I keep bringing it back to the cinematic aspect of, uh, of it, but um, there is one of the things I greatly admire about the film is how such dense subject and information is being given to us, but it is it is accessible and and it's and it's very. Um, you know, I'm at the edge of my seat, although I knew what was going to happen at the end. Um, Rick, when you were uh, building this and Larry chime in as well, were you guys conscious of, of keeping things to a layman's term at, at times and, and the amount of information that was being given? I mean, constantly, constantly. I mean, the, the struggle with a film like this, the, uh, the goal of a film like this 
uh, is to not have it turn into an essay, uh, to have it still unfold as a series of scenes that have logics to them and that, that you know, that, that lead and explode inevitably into the next scene and that move on. And then, I mean, you know, uh, if, you, if, you have, if you have a life with a structure like this, like, I mean, where these are big, they're big moves that are happening for Jamal, right? Like huge, like he's, you know, he becomes overnight becomes famous and then overnight, like his world is destroyed. And then overnight again, like, it, I mean, these are massive, uh, both massive world shaking kind of events that he participates in and huge life transforming kind of turns for, for him personally. So with that kind of clarity, um, then, you know, you, there's a lot, there's a lot more freedom to do stuff in between. But I mean, just as a matter of craft, the way we always approach it is to try to not, not lay out the argument you're gonna make and make the argument and have points to support it. But, um, but you know, divide it up as scenes and tell it and make it unfold as a story. And yeah, you always have to be carefully trying to pitch your voice to the hearing of your audience and not go, uh, not assume too much, not assume too little. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's the, the nature of the kind of balancing act. One of the things that Rick does so well in this, you know, when you have a story that like this, that takes place in an exotic locale, you know, with, you know, odd national, you know, uniforms or costumes and so on, people tend to look at it as being too exotic and they don't see the humanity of the people that you're dealing with. And that's one of the things about the film that I think Rick did so well is you, he made you see Jamal as a, as a human being, not just as a Saudi, but, you know, somebody you could, you know, you could engage with and his humor his his you know, his earnestness, all of those wonderful human qualities that are displayed in this. So you're not lost in the exoticism of his background. Something that's that started so uh, narrow in focus, um, Rick and Larry ends up having this big epic scope when when the film ends and that was actually as the credits were rolling I was going like oh my god I just watched this big big uh epic um where was that was never your intention right Rick and Larry I mean it it became our intention very quickly right I mean uh yeah I mean in the in the beginning I was focused narrowly on the murder but but once uh, it, it didn't take long to realize how big and sweeping and epic this man's life was and how it touched upon um, you know, the most important moments of uh, the last 30 years in our foreign policy in, in many ways. And also in, to me personally, um, you know, retraced some of my own steps. I mean, when I was up in the Panjshir with Abdullah Anas, like filming and you know, as we were heading down to Kabul, retracing Jamal's steps, I mean, I was a young reporter there, uh, you know, 15 years ago, covering the same war in, in many ways, the continuation of the same war that Jamal had covered in 1986, right? I mean, that um, it, uh, uh, it was, it was a, a very moving experience for me personally too, to like move through, uh, be able to move through his story like that, a privilege to be able to move through his story like that. And, um, and Larry, I, since you're here, I, 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 I'm dying to ask you about your opinion about what's happening, you know, the, the recent news about the, our Justice Department and the involvement with, with journalists, you know, would you like to comment on that? Well, I'm glad that the Justice Department has changed hands. Uh, the, you know, it's, it's hard to be a journalist. It's hard enough anyway, if you have freedom of action, just getting people to talk to you. But when you're hounded and followed by the government, that's no longer America. That's the, you know, there's no freedom of the press when the government is trying to impound your calls and, and stop you from talking to your sources. And there was nothing illegal that any of those reporters did. So yeah, it's outrageous. And um, you know, we, have to, we have to be constantly on guard about that. Yeah, I mean, the reason why I brought, up, brought it up is because your documentary, there are parallels that I kept seeing, yeah. you know, between, you know, the firmer administration and what was happening around Jamal. Um, yeah, I think that's a good observation and, and a dismal one, but I agree with you. Yeah, well, gents, this has been quite a thrill to 
to chat with you. Uh, and thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. The documentary is Kingdom of Silence. It's in showtime. I encourage everybody who's listening to, if you haven't seen it yet, to, to watch it. It's essential viewing. So um, thank you both Rick and Larry. My pleasure. Thank you. This is great. Absolutely. Thank you. Bye.